I'm going to get started. Thank you everyone for joining. My name is Alicia and I'm with Chariot Solutions. I'm here to introduce our speakers, Lima Nasseri and Matt Hawthorne, presenting a low first guide to software engineering, which I am extremely interested in so I can have a little more free time. Go ahead. Sounds good. Thanks, Alicia. So yeah, hello. Welcome to our talk, Doing More by Doing Less, a low first guide to software engineering. My name is Lima. I'm an engineering manager at Spotify, uh, specifically working on personalization with the wonderful people of the home product area. So I'll be giving you the engineering manager's perspective for this talk, whereas Matt will be giving you the engineer's point of view. Yeah, my name is Matt Hawthorne. I'm an engineer at Comcast. I work mainly in um, the customer experience org on uh, messaging architecture. And so our talk today is inspired by a book, How to Be Idle, A Loafer's Manifesto, written in 2004 by Tom Hodgkinson. Um, I don't remember how I found this. It might have been a, a recommendation on Twitter or, or something like that, but um, it jumped out to me as interesting. I, I like being idle. And so um, I read through it and um, I found it really funny. You know, he suggests things like um, alarm clocks are evil. You should not have an alarm clock. You should not have a schedule. Um, and some of these things are not really practical for the corporate world, but I, I felt like it would be interesting to think about um, corporate life in the context of this book. Like, could we do things to take a step in this direction, to be a little less scheduled, to be um, take a bit more control of our, our time and our lives? And, um, and that's, uh, that's what we're gonna to do today. Yeah, sounds good. And so a disclaimer up front, uh, today's talk, it's not intended to be a criticism of, of either of our companies. Uh, we both very much enjoy working at our companies and all, all companies really have these problems, you know, meetings and time management and, and, and these things. Yeah, so before we get into it, let's highlight a couple well-known and quite successful individuals that somewhat adhere to tactics we'll discuss later in this talk. So for example, Jeff Bezos has said, has been known to say that he aims to make three high quality decisions per day and that he schedules all of his high, high priority meetings between 10 and noon. That's only two hours. So think about that. And Daniel Eck, who's the CEO of Spotify said he rarely has more than four meetings per day and that his work day doesn't start until 10.30 a.m. And so think about how busy your schedule is compared with these two successful CEOs. Uh, do you have more than four meetings per day? Does your day start earlier than 10 or 10.30? And if so, why? Why is your schedule busier than a CEO's schedule? Does that make sense to you? So let's go through some, some red flags here about um, what are some signs that you're, you're doing too much? Uh, can you think of anything Lima? Yeah. Um, so I think one red flag or a sign is you have no time for lunch. If you think it's a good idea to get lunch delivered to your desk, that's not a good sign. Go for a walk, move a little, enjoy the food that's like nourishing your body to give you the energy to do all of this great work. Um, so yeah, that's one red flag. Can you think of another one, Matt? Or some people just skip lunch altogether. They right. Choose right. to work over surviving. Um, <laughs> another one that I can think of is uh, you have a, a no meetings day on your team, which, which is maybe mm -hmm. a sign that you have too many meetings. But then there's also meetings on the no meetings day. I struggle right. with this quite a bit. I look on my calendar, it says no meetings day, but then there's a meeting invite for a meeting right. on no meetings day. So that's, I think, a, a red flag. I agree. Um, I think another red flag is you do your real work at night. I totally did this. I do it occasionally, but there was a time in my life like a few years ago where I would, all of my real work was done at night. And that's, that's clearly a red flag. Yeah, another one I can think of is uh, every time I hear that sound of the, like the inbox sound from my email, I cringe because <laughs> I just envision looking at my inbox and being a, an invite to another meeting and particularly another meeting that starts five minutes from now. Like I thought, I thought my day was planned. I thought I was going to have the next few hours free. Now there's a, a meeting in five minutes. I, I was not expecting that. Um, so I think those are uh, at least the most, the most glaring ones. Mm -hmm. All right, so maybe there should be a trigger warning before my next slide or our next slide. Um, keep in mind, the first step to recovery is acceptance. 
Okay, so this is a screenshot of my calendar from a few weeks ago. Um, it could be considered one of my good days. Uh, the point of the screenshot is not to showcase that I'm busy. That's not the goal at all. My point is to say, I'm not an expert at employing the doing more by doing less theory that we'll dive more into in this talk, but I'm always sincerely trying to simply simplify my calendar. Um, it's a constant work in progress and that's okay as long as, as long as we have a few tax tactics to solve it. Yeah, and this is uh, what I call a bad day for my calendar. Ignore those three blocks on the left. I'll, I'll explain those um, in, a, in a future slide. I think there were maybe eight meetings on this day. I went to four or five. Um, you know, one of these was a 90 minute interview, which, um, you know, I don't have those every day or even every week, but through this phase, we were doing uh, quite a bit of them. Um, but I think the point here and why this is a bad day for me is if you look at the blocks of time in between the meetings, is there really enough time to actually do anything there significant? I mean, it, it depends on the type of work, but, you know, um, an hour here, an hour there, it's really tough to, to get things done uh, on a day like this. Yeah, so as we dive into the guts of this talk, keep in mind time and energy are your most valuable resources. Time is finite, you can't make more time. There are obviously only 24 hours in a day and energy is very similar, exactly the same. You only have so much energy that can be expended within that finite time. So we're not machines, so keep this in mind. And in time management, it's not something you ever solve or figure out. Um, every day is a battle. Um, and so I think, you know, our point today is that if you have the right mindset mm -hmm. and a good set of habits and discipline, you can bring that into every day and you start winning more battles than you lose. You know, if I can win three days a week or even four days a week, you know, um, that that's success for me, you know, have more control of my time, the majority of the time. That's, um, I think that's a, that that's a more, a practical goal. And doing less doesn't just mean not doing anything. It means um, minimizing the number of things you work on so you can um, do more in, in each of those areas. Yeah, or in that same sense for broader manager or architect roles, it's about making sure you can spend sufficient time on the things that matter. So I remember back in the day, so Matt and I used to work together at Comcast. Um, we were on the same team. I had the honor of being his manager for a little bit um, and had just became director and I was still writing code. So still shipping code that went to production. And, you know, it's typically not a good thing for a director of engineering to do. Um, of course, I don't do that today. I've learned that that's not the best use of my time. But back when um, Matt and I would have really long one-on-ones, um, he said something to me that was very profound and that made me somewhat stop writing code as a director. Um, and he said that the time I'm spending writing code is time spent where I could be doing something that the team can't do because you're, they're not in my role. So in essence, as my role at the time, I wasn't spending my time on the right things that mattered given my role. Yeah, it depends on the role. I think, you know, yeah. if, if you're if you're an engineer and, and your job is to write code, then you want to be able to make more time for that. Totally. If you're more of an architect, it might be more diagrams or, you know, um, documentation, stuff for like sure. that. What, whatever that is, you want to make more time for that. Mm -hmm. All right. So you may ask yourself, what if I like working on a lot of things? It's totally fine, but we're here to show you that you have a choice. So Matt, tell us why doing less is important. So I'm going to make a, a software to, software systems to human systems analogy here. So if you can imagine um, what I'm calling a typical HTTP service um, with a bunch of clients on the left, and this service, um, you know, maybe is is interacting with the data store, maybe is calling some other services, might be writing some data to disk. Um, you've got a thread pool up front. And you have this queue of requests that as any of these things that I mentioned start to slow down, your queue starts to fill up. And typically in software systems, as your queue fills up, um, requests start seeing higher latency. So requests get slower. But with regards to uh, human systems, your, your timeouts are going to be a lot longer. You know, it's, it's mm -hmm. typical for a, like in software systems, your timeout might be 100 milliseconds or, you know, 500 milliseconds, one second, et cetera. But when humans interact, um, you know, you don't typically interact with humans with a hundred millisecond timeout. That's not reasonable. Timeouts are more 
um, hours or days or months. Sometimes it's even, you know, you have a quarter to, to finish something. Right. And so I think um, it's not so much you're going to start seeing timeouts to your uh, human clients. It's just that you're going to um, start completing your tasks with a lower quality. Basically, you're, you're, doing, um, you're doing more things uh, uh, with less quality. Another way of saying that is the more things you do, the worse you are at everything. And so to, to talk about more in terms of uh, data consistency, there's the CAP theorem, uh, consistency, availability, partition tolerance. And so the notion here, people typically say, you know, choose two. You can't have all three. Um, I, I try to look at it like you're, you're, it's not that the one that you don't choose is a, a zero. It's that you're just optimizing uh, for the, the other two. Um, and for example, if you... Um, if you say I need a system that is strongly consistent and you know partition tolerance, typically that there's nothing you can do about that if you're going over a network, then your availability is going to suffer. In other words, your latency is going to go up. Uh, you can't defeat the cap theorem. I I see someone probably um, at least once a year. Someone will think that they can have a strongly consistent system that somehow uh, latency does not go up. I have never actually seen that happen successfully. Um, it's one of those things that uh, I think we forget it and then we try it and then we remember that, oh yeah, we can't defeat the cap theorem. So this is what I'm calling the SAP theorem, which I'm trying to apply um, the, the cap theorem of software systems into human systems, right? I think there's, there's three real things you're trying to balance here. There's, there's sanity, availability, and productivity. And you have to um, choose the two that you want to optimize for. And so for me, typically I'm, I'm prioritizing sanity. And so I'm either gonna be sane and available, which means I'm gonna be available for meetings, available to fix production issues or investigate production issues, things like that. Um, or I'm gonna be sane and productive, meaning I'm writing code, uh, doing documentation, doing diagrams, that type of work. Um, I, I can't do all three of those. And so my days are typically one of those two. And what about you, Lima? Which, which two of these do you typically optimize for? Yeah, so I guess it definitely depends on the day. Um, probably as a manager, I do optimize for availability because I, I don't, I feel like I need to be available for the like wonderful humans that I get the luxury to manage. Um, and then productivity in some sense in that like I, my team is productive. Like it's not, maybe it's not necessarily me, but if I'm available to unblock or, you know, be there for like emotional support or something, um, it makes my team more productive. And I think I gain my sanity back on those no meeting days. Like we have a weekly no meeting day on Wednesday and I get to just, I barely have any meetings and it's wonderful. All right, so yeah, so availability, productivity, we just, Matt just described that in the SAP theorem of his. Um, so your availability and productivity balance depends on your particular role. So examples of high availability roles could be, you know, production on call. If you're on call for a tier one or service that is taking a lot of traffic for users um, and you just need that to be available. So being available to handle issues when they arise is important, right? Um, another example could be an engineering manager with many reports. Um, like I think I've alluded to this, but I was very lucky that when I was an engineer, I always felt somehow magically my managers were there for me. Whenever I had something to deal with or something I needed their help on, they were just always there for me. And I, as a manager now, I'm like, how did they make that happen? So I feel a similar, similar responsibility. You never know what people are dealing with. Life is complex. Let's make work less complex by being there for your engineers. In other words, highly available. Um, on the other hand though, examples of highly productive are engineers with a deadline that they have to meet, you know, pressures on, um, engineers not involved in cross team work. So one would typically say cross team collaboration is hard. You have to get folks to buy in, make sure the work is split fairly so everyone feels fulfilled, et cetera. When the work is enclosed within your team, that usually lends itself to highly productive. So it really just depends on your role, which one you can lean into. Yeah, and, and the follow on to something I think you said in the, the last slide that like productivity means different things depending on your role. Like as a manager, right. for you to be productive might be optimizing your team's productivity. Right. Um, I'm in more of an architect role right now where it's not so much about me having time to write code, it's about me um, enabling the engineers that I work with to be more productive, you know, you're kind of thinking yeah. of scaling ourselves in that way. Yeah. Yeah, so that being said, having impact is important. It's super important. 
we talked about this a bit in a prior talk that Matt and I did last year about having novel stories, which you can speak to um, not only for your current job, but when you interview for your next job. Um, so if you don't have imp impactful work, you most likely won't get promoted, which sounds harsh, um, or rewarded with better pay or better opportunities. And uh, yeah, that might sound harsh, but it's, it's kind of the truth. Yeah, and I think regardless of, of what role you're in, if at the end of, you know, if you look back on the last quarter, the last six months, mm -hmm. and you can't think of anything you can point to and say either I did that or I was a significant contributor to that, yeah. uh, I think you're going to have problems. Right. And so I think that's kind of the point here is um, being able to be more conscious that you're having a clear impact on specific right. projects as opposed to kind of um, just generally helping with things. Yeah. All right, so that's a nice segue into what we mean by important work. We think that important work means important to you and how you decide what important is, is what we'll discuss in the next few slides. So yeah, so important work typically has one or more of these traits or attributes. Um, you learn something valuable or interesting, that's, that, that would be important work to me. Um, you build relationships with people that you possibly could learn from or could help you pivot to another interesting project or make your current project more interesting. That's, that's important work. Um, or it's just fun. Sometimes it's, it's all good wanting to do something because you enjoy it. It really doesn't always need to be something new or novel. Yeah, and there's, there's unimportant work or that we're, we're calling unimportant. And mm -hmm. I don't think it's possible to avoid... Uh, avoid all of that. I, th I think the key is to find some sort of balance in, in your days and your weeks. And so I read something somewhere, I, I can't remember where, and it said every day you should focus on completing one thing you have to do, one mm -hmm. thing you should do, and one thing you want to do. And this would help you um, feel more satisfied every day. And, and if you right. are working in a broader role, may maybe every day is a practical, maybe every week or every month. And so this is something that I, I try to keep in mind. That is, if I have a day where it's just, you know, it's just reacting to things. It's you know, mm -hmm. investigating incidents or getting pulled into meetings. Can I make at least a little bit of time to do something that I personally find interesting or that's moving right. forward a project that I personally care about? Um, right. And if I'm able to do that, I'm, I'm able to feel much better um, at the end of the day or you know, much better about my work in general. Yeah, no, I agree. I think we all have to do things that we have to do, but we don't necessarily like it. And being able to carve time to do something that we enjoy or want to do makes us like less resentful for doing that other work. It's like, it's okay. I have to do that. It makes sense. It's part of my job. And then here's like a chunk of time to do something I'm actually really interested in. So let's talk about some principles of energy management. Um, I think that energy is more important than time. The, the reason, um, the reason I feel that way is this, if you, let's say you free up two hours for yourself at the end of the day, but if you don't have any energy to do anything in that two hours, if you're totally exhausted from all your meetings or whatever you have to do, you're not really going to get anything done. Whereas if you have, if you have the right amount of energy or sufficient amount of energy, you can get a lot done with just 15 minutes per day. You're not necessarily going to get a lot done on an individual day, but if that 15 minutes over the course of a few weeks or months, it really does add up. And so I think, I think the point here is it's not, um, it's not just time management, it's making sure you have the right amount of energy also. Yeah, so speaking on energy a bit more, um, some things give you energy and other things take energy away. For example, status meetings drain my energy. I know it's necessary, but they're a bit draining sometimes. And one of an example, recently one of my wonderful peer engineering managers recently integrated with this tool or platform or whatever called Coda. Um, and it sends you an email asks to update the status, done, no meeting is required. He's made all of our lives better. And <laughs> I have a little bit more energy in that day because I wasn't in that 30 minute status meeting. So that's an example of something that drains my energy. An example of something that gives me energy is spending time querying data. I know that might sound uh, strange, but trying to find some golden insight or some good data set that could lead to building a heuristic or a feature for a model within a model that gives me energy because my brain finds that more interesting than, you know, than the necessary work that's required to be in a status meeting. Do you, do you have any examples of either of these, Matt? 
Uh, I think it's interesting. You made a point that maybe status meetings aren't necessary after all. We we finally solved that problem. <laughs> but but as as far as yeah, things that give me energy, um, I'm similar. Like I, I really like looking at data. I'm mm -hmm. doing too much of that in my job right now. But um, I like looking at metrics, which I guess metrics are data also. I spent maybe an hour or two last week just looking at metrics on one of the systems I work with that I'm trying to understand a little better. You know, made a dashboard with some graphs. And I found that really interesting. I came away from that knowing a lot more than I knew before, or at least having a different perspective on it. And that was something that I, you know, I made time for something that I wanted to do that right. gave me energy. And um, I felt better at the end of that day. Right. That's what matters. So different, everyone's brain is different and then different brains uh, work best on different things at different times. Um, there's a, uh, I bring this up for a few reasons. One is that, um, you know, some people are morning people. Some people are just sharper in the morning. Some people are sharper at night. Um, some people are sharper in the afternoon, although I think that's maybe less common. And so it's, it's important that, you know, when, when you're looking for opportunities to make time for yourself, that you um, are able to choose that time based on when you know that you can use that time right. most efficiently, you know, so um, making time at the end of the day might be more convenient in terms of your schedule. But at the end of the day, what if you're brain dead and not actually able to, to do anything? Yeah. Um, so it might be better to make that time in the morning. Mm -hmm. But another um, thing here, it's kind of related is that I know for me, my brain kind of goes into different phases. And in each of those phases, I can do certain times of certain types of work the best like mm -hmm. there's a certain um phase my brain is in where i can i can write more complicated code i can do things like design documents where i really have to think hard about how to present something to be able to sell it or i can run a meeting where i have to really drive it so that we can get towards a, a decision which is very um consumes a lot of energy versus like so that those things all take a lot of energy versus mm -hmm. maybe reviewing a document reviewing a pr um, more casually attending a meeting where you don't have to like listen to every single word. You can kind of just more casually listen for things that that doesn't take as much energy. And so I, I don't have to be as careful about uh, how I plan that. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, so simply said, the less things you do, the more energy you have to give towards those things. And the energy is like that, it's higher quality that you're giving towards those things. Okay, so let's talk about techniques for doing less. Schedule focus time. There are apps that can actually help with this. Like there's an app called Clockwise um, that I see a lot of folks at Spotify have integrated within their Google Calendar. How the app blocks said focus time, I have no idea, but I see it says focus time. Um, and that helps, that helps, that focus time can be used towards doing those tasks that are somewhat harder to do if you've got 20 different meetings that you have to attend within a day. Sitting and thinking is working. I think that um, we all define availability in different ways in terms of like for some people, um, if I'm not in a meeting, that means I'm available to go to another meeting. But I, I don't really think of it that way. I think of it like um, if I make time to sit and think about a problem, I mean, you know, maybe you're writing some notes, but however you want to do it, that time is important too. That time is helping me move towards a goal or solve an important problem for my company. I'm not available during that time. And so I think it's, I think it's, it's important to make sure that we're classifying sitting and thinking about solving problems as a first class citizen. This isn't just something that you do when you have spare time. This is something that's really critical to your job. Yeah. Therefore, when you are doing this, you are not available to do other things. Declining meetings. And so this is um, this is cultural. I think different um, companies handle this in different ways and different people do. I know that like I tend to decline. Uh, the other people will tend to just not accept and not show up. Mm -hmm. I find that doesn't work well for me because if I do that, I then get a slack two minutes into the meeting saying, hey, are you coming to the meeting? A lot of times, even if I decline, I get a slack message saying, hey, are you coming? I say, I declined. Mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of the point of declining. But I think um, you have to define your boundaries. You know, what happens is like, you might schedule focus time, like Lima said a few slides ago, and then someone schedules a meeting on top of it. Now there's, yeah. there's a judgment call there as to, like if my manager does that, I'm, I'm, I might still go, I'm more likely to go right. um, because that's my manager. But mm -hmm. if it's a, 
someone that I don't know as well, you know, I think you have to establish a boundary to say that mm -hmm. this, this is my time. I'm busy during this time. I'm not available to go to your meeting. That's yeah. why my calendar was blocked. Yeah. So no, it's really about how you want to handle it. Yeah. As in, people typically hopefully should respect those boundaries. And so this is uh, a couple examples from my schedule. So this was a good day. I only had three meetings and, um, and plenty of time in the afternoon to actually get some work done. And so this was the bad day that I, I showed earlier. And the way that I handle my schedule is once it fills up to what I view as capacity, like, you know, I looked at this day and my whole afternoon is pretty much burnt because I have the, the interview. I'm not going to have a lot of energy after that. The morning wasn't great either. Um, so I just fill in the rest of the time. You know, I had like four or five meetings I was going to go to. This day is done. I have this morning, lunch, and evening that's scheduled every day, and I just click and drag it to fill in the rest of the time. Um, there's another benefit um, benefit to that too that I block out lunch every day. I know some people do the honor system where you like don't schedule meetings between twelve and one. I do my lunch between one and two. But but what starts happening is someone has an emergency meeting the day before. All of a sudden you get a meeting at noon saying, I couldn't find any other time to schedule it. Yeah, why do you think you couldn't find, why do you think noon was open for everyone? There's this honor system of not scheduling during lunch that you just violated. And the same thing with evening. I usually, my evening starts at five. I don't like having meetings at five. I think there's plenty of other times to have meetings other than 5 p.m. or later. Same thing with morning. Usually my day starts at 10. Um, occasionally there's one at 9.30 I'll go to, but you know, sometimes people will um, try to schedule at eight and that's just, that's just too early for me. So if you block it off, you're clearly saying I'm not available during this time and hopefully people respect it. Yeah, you're, you're setting boundaries. Exactly. So in terms of how you interact with your colleagues, and again, this, this depends on how you wanna handle it. It's maybe a bit, certainly a bit different now than when we were all in offices. But I know like when we were working in offices, what I would see a lot is someone comes to your cubicle and says, let's say it's like 11 a.m. and they say, Hey, I want to come by and talk to you about something at two. Mm -hmm. And my view on that is there's a there's technology that we have to solve that problem. It's called a calendar. Go ahead and schedule some time at two. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important for two reasons. The one is that I don't want to have to remember who's coming to my cube at what time to talk about what. Use the calendar, schedule it. That way I can, um, you know, I don't have to remember it. And two is in, with cubicles, depends on your office, but like for me, especially in open plan offices, it gets very loud. Yeah. I prefer to have a conversation in a room with a door that closes rather than around all of my cubicle mates. So we're going to have a loud conversation and bother them. So it's the other benefit of scheduling is you actually can put it um, scheduled in a room um, so that you're not uh, bothering all of your neighbors. Yeah. And another one is embrace or normalize the concept of saying no. And you can say it in a polite way so no one is offended. And you can even suggest someone else instead, give someone else an opportunity. This is something that I think about a lot as a manager is spreading the wealth, spreading the opportunities. Um, but if we embrace this concept of saying no, it'll, it'll likely free up our own time to, you know, do more by doing less. Yeah. And sometimes it's, it's um, one way of, I guess, softening that is it's just not now. I don't have time for this project Yeah, or this yeah, month or this quarter. This or whatever. Yeah. Uh, delegating and asking for help. And maybe um, maybe this is easy for a lot of you. Um, it's certainly not easy for me. And so I think this is tricky for a few reasons. The one is that, um, you know, as an engineer, as like an individual contributor, I'm not anyone's boss. And mm -hmm. so it's awkward sometimes to ask some, to try to delegate to someone when you are not their boss. And they right. might look at you and say, why are you giving me work? Right. Um, but I think there's motivation there to try to build a stronger relationship with some of your teammates, especially some of your, your younger teammates that might be looking to have more interesting work sent their way. And you can say, hey, can you look at this graph for me? Or can you, you know, do this PR for me or whatever it is? Um, look for opportunities to build relationships to allow you to delegate. I think asking for help is a tricky one too. I know I personally struggle with that. Mm -hmm. A lot that when you actually in when you, when you are in over your head when you have too mm -hmm. much going on when you just have like too much on your plate today or this week or this quarter that to um to kind of humble yourself and say I can't do all of this myself right. I need some help um, ideally your manager can help you with this that you can say look I have too much can you um, spread some of this work around the team 
Mm -hmm. you are not guaranteed that your manager is going to help you with that. You might be on your own. And so mm -hmm. again, this is an incentive for you to build stronger relationships with your teammates. So you can say, Hey, yeah. can you help me out with this thing? And, um, ideally you built that relationship by maybe helping them with something in the past. So yeah. they're more likely to want to help you. And so I think there's, um, there's some solutions to this, uh, whether you're an IC or a manager. Yeah. From the manager's point of view, I don't know if you remember this, this is another anecdote from one of our one-on-ones back in the day. Um, this is again, when I was, I was probably doing too much when I worked at Comcast and you asked me at one of my, you started to ask me at our one-on-ones, what's one thing you delegated this week? And I see it goes both ways. It's not just engineers, it's managers too. You know, like managers should be delegating more. I shouldn't be doing like all of the AB test analysis or preparing all the decks and getting all the graphs. Like I was, I was doing too much. And it's, it's an example of a time that I reflect on that's like, I should, I should be sharing this, you know, I should have been asking for help. I think that a lot of what we're talking about today is prioritization, right? Focus on stuff that's important, kind of push the other stuff uh, to the side or deprioritize it. But I, I find that there's two types of work that are the hardest to prioritize. Mm -hmm. And the one is the stuff that's important, but not time sensitive. And so an example of this is like architectural improvements that the product team is never going to ask for. Right. The system's not falling over. So it's not urgent. It's not causing outages. But you see that if I was able to make this improvement, it's going to, you know, definitely have an impact. But mm -hmm. but it's it's only going to happen if you make it happen. You know, no one outside of yourself is really looking for this. Um, so you really have to set aside time to work on this. This is an example of something where I might set aside an hour a week, 30 minutes a week, work on some slides, work on some diagrams, work on kind of a, a pitch for this so that you can um, get more time to work on it. And another uh, type of um, item that is really hard to prioritize is things that you're interested in, but you just, you just don't have time for it. I'm saying not important here, um, but it's you know not important, don't have time for it. It depends how you want to describe it. But I think the point here is that you know there's a project going on, it's, it's something that you find interesting, and it, but it's, it's hard for you to come to terms with the fact that you already have too much on your plate. You just don't have capacity to take this on right now, even though you find it interesting. And so you really have to have the discipline to say, no, I can't do this right now, maybe next month, maybe next quarter. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about some of the consequences or repercussions of doing less. You'll miss meetings and that's okay. Your team will be better for it. It's good for the team to be able to figure out how to navigate things without you to be there all the time. This is actually a good thing. It may sound like a bad thing, but it's a good thing. Yeah, one of the hard things about missing meetings is um, people are gonna make decisions that you disagree with. There's this concept I've, um, I've heard before where it's like you attend meetings sometimes defensively. Because you, you go to the meeting just to make sure that the bad thing doesn't happen. Um, you have to let go of that a bit. That um, you, if you don't have time to be involved in a project, that means you're not going to be able to impact it in, in the way that, that you would like to. And you have to, um, you have to just accept that and, um, and, and move on from it. Yeah. Forget about FOMO. Just like get rid of that. You can't be involved in everything. Right. Yeah, so in a similar vein, letting go is a big part of delegating or stepping away from certain projects. From a manager's point of view, you have to find ways to empower your people. That is so important. If you're in all the meetings, doing all of the things, you're taking the fun out of engineering. That's literally something I think Matt has said back in the day. Um, so sometimes just take a step back, let your wonderful people figure out the tactics. You just make sure you, you know set the vision, set the runway and let go. <laughs> Yeah, and sometimes it's about um, learning to get comfortable with letting other people make yeah. mistakes sometimes. And I think that's that's a concept for managers, definitely. But even as an engineer, um, you, you have a feeling that in your absence, a bad choice is going to be made that might cause some problems in production um, or might, you know, mm. cause some type of problem. And sometimes you just have to accept that, you know, I can't be involved, therefore there might be an outage. I mean, you, you just don't have time to be involved in it and you have to get more comfortable with, um, also it's a learning experience, right? It's a, ideally it's not, the decisions aren't so bad that they're causing an outage, but if, it, if it's a, a smaller type of mistake or um, 
problem that's caused in your absence, maybe that's fine. Maybe the people that make that mistake learn from that and then the whole company is better off for it. So let's talk about uh, what I'm calling here organizational queuing. So um, there's different categories of work that come into a team. Um, you got prod support at the top, like bugs being reported or I guess deployments also got um, product features and infrastructure work uh, coming in and you have um, bugs at the bottom. And the point of this slide is that there's different categories. It depends on your team. Maybe you have, you know, each person on your team handles architecture and development work and operation stuff. Um, maybe it's split into different groups. It, it depends on your company. But the point is that there are different categories of work, different queues, and there's different types of work that go um, into each of these queues. And when you think about like, um, you know, one of the most important metrics for a, a team or a company is how fast does it, or how long does it take us to get stuff into production, like a new yeah. feature or a fix or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's important to come to terms with that. The rate that you get stuff into production is the, the minimum rate that you can consume for each of these queues. You know, I've seen a situation before where the team is maybe struggling getting things into prod. So we add a bunch of architects. Well, <laughs> if your problem is that you aren't able to deploy stuff quickly enough or your um, deployment infrastructure isn't in place or you don't have enough people you know mm -hmm. doing the actual implementation all the adding architects does is now you just have a bunch more diagrams that you don't have time to actually implement and deploy that's not actually solving your biggest problem mm -hmm. um and so in each of these areas it's kind of like a zero-sum game you know if you have a lot of production incidents and that's taking a lot of your operation team's um time then they're not going to have as much time to do deployments. Um, if you have a lot of bugs to fix on your development team, um, you're not going to have as much time to build features. Mm -hmm. And if you have a lot of new features to design, like more complicated features that need like more architecture uh, work, you're not going to have as much time to do the, the infrastructural architecture work. And so if you just imagine one of those cues um, from the, the last diagram, um, each of these circles here is one of your team members. And so, you know, each of your team members is like a, a consumer of the items that are in that queue and then the work is completed. And I think it's important for individual contributors to think about the volume of items that you're taking from the queue, but also the diversity of those items. Are you taking all architecture work and no operations work? And, and how do you feel about that? Um, you want to find a way to ensure that the work is balanced fairly across your team. Now, it, I, I, it's not necessarily going to be balanced evenly. It depends on your team, depends on your skill sets and all of that. But if you, um, and think about how that maps to your interests, you know, I think, um, you know, something that can happen is you, you're involved in a lot of like operational stuff, production fixes, outages, that type of stuff, but you want to be involved in more like longer term architecture work. You have to, to find a way to, um, so that the operations work that you're taking is being spread more fairly across your team so that you can take on more work that you're you're interested in. Oh, sorry, this is your slide and I took it. Okay. <laughs> you can take this one. I go for it. Um, so there's a few different techniques to, um, to, to achieve the balance I was talking about. Um, on call rotations are a pretty common one mm -hmm. where, you know, that's a way of ensuring that we are all at least sharing the burden of supporting these systems in production. Um, you would think that every company has an on-call rotation or every team, but I, I really don't think that's the case. I think there's a lot of situations still where there's like one person that just absorbs all of that. And that that's certainly not fair. Yeah, and when there's the example of something that we're working through right now is there's shared infrastructure, which team, is everyone on call for that? Or is it a specific team? Do we rotate those teams? Yeah, it's a it's, it's a universal problem. Yeah, and I think docs and knowledge sharing also help. Um, you know, if you find that you are always having to answer questions about something, people are always coming to you on a certain topic, write a doc, start pointing people to that doc. You just freed yourself up some time. Um, or maybe you write a doc to describe how to maintain a certain um, part of your software stack. Now you can point your teammates to it and say, whoever's on call can handle this now. I'm not mm -hmm. going to be the only person that does it. Uh, you just bought yourself some time. All right, so final thoughts on our talk about doing more by doing less. Again, time is finite. Time is actually a gift, one could say. So use it wisely. Your time is valuable and your time is yours.
Yeah, don't just think about time management. You want to make sure um, you're thinking about energy management too. In particular, when, when you do free up time, make sure that you have energy to actually use that time uh, effectively. Yeah, keep in mind what's important to you as we articulated earlier and make time to work on those things. There's a balance between taking one for the team occasionally and then doing that task that drains you over and over again. Um, so yeah, so just make sure there's a there's a clear balance. And what's important to you will likely change over time, you know, especially as you move forward in your career, you know, maybe you go from an engineer to an architect. And so, you know, it's not so much about freeing up time to write code. It's more about, you know, diagrams or doing, working on more forward looking stuff, going from an engineer um, to a manager, you know, the way you think about productivity is going to change the way you think about availability certainly has to change. And even, you know, changes in your personal life might affect the way that you um, think about your work life balance and things like that. I think the key is that um, you, the specific things you're optimizing for might change. The important part is that you have the, you're thinking about the, the mindset and the habits to allow you to, to take more control of your time. And that's it. Thank you. I think we're going to take some questions if we have any. Thank you very much. Yes, we do have questions. And if anyone has questions, please send them in Zoom chat or Slack room B. Uh, so first off, this one's a bit of a long one. Uh, since we started working remotely, uh, it's helped manage time better. In the office, people would stop by for various reasons and didn't have, a, uh, and you didn't have a block of time to focus on something difficult. So in this way, remote has been liberating and an important productivity boost. Uh, any thoughts on how the last year has impacted your work? Yeah. Also, hey, Paul. <laughs> Paul Duanel from We Used to Work Together. Um, yeah, I mean, back to the office time, I totally agree that I feel like I'm more productive at home. I remember when we used to work at Comcast, I would sometimes hide <laughs> to be more productive. Um, I would actually hide on his floor because um, I worked on a different floor. Um, I think... I'm actually starting to see a trend where I'm too productive. Like I, it doesn't stop. Like I need, like, I need to like stop at five or stop at six. Right. Like I, I, there are instances where like, I haven't walked the dog for six hours. Like, and that's not, the dog needs to go for a walk, you know? Um, so it's, I'm going through a different experience right now, um, especially cause it's so fun. I guess it's hard to stop. Matt, what are your thoughts? You're too productive. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think like it's it's definitely helped to establish some boundaries in terms of yeah. we no longer have to hide because we're all kind of <laughs> hiding in our houses. And I used, I used to also now. <laughs> I used to also hide when I was in the office. I think um, I think um, you meant, made a good point, Lima, about like the bound. This is just like a general working from home problem that yeah. the, the boundary between like when the work day ends and your personal day begins and, and right. vice versa is kind of fuzzy. Now I kind of like that though. I, I don't think I am having the problem of being too productive. I think that's, um, that's maybe yours and yours alone, but I, but I think, um, I like the fact that I can work at different times. Like maybe I have, um, I don't have anything going on between three and four, and so I don't, I don't have to work between three and four, but I might work between like eight and nine instead because my brain just might be sharper at that time on that day. So I think that the, the flexibility is definitely one of the nice things that I appreciate. Thank you. Do you find that focus days make any difference uh, or does it only serve to cram the same number of meetings into fewer days? Yeah, no, we have that problem. Um, or I sometimes will do that, like I'll cram everything just to keep Wednesday pure or the no, the no meeting day at Spotify pure. Um, I still think it helps though, even though there's cramming, like just because I don't, I, I act like it's, I actually have a whole day where I don't have, rarely have meetings. And in place of that, I think I'd have a few meetings on that day. And I can't, I, I can't do like, I can't like read a design or like a doc thoroughly when I have like a meeting every two hours, you know, like just having the, the focus time where it's the entire day helps me at least. Um, and then I feel like I'm more energized for the following day, even if it's crammed. 
Yeah, I think we should do like the opposite of focus day. I think we should cram every meeting into like one day. Just let's have straight like nine to five or even like eight to six all meetings. And then the other days are open. And like there's such um there's a, there's a quote I heard once about like it's very often you have an hour long meeting and it goes like, you know, two minutes over and the people the reaction will be the next one needs to be 90 minutes. I think it's the opposite. If you have a 60 minute meeting that goes over, make the next one 30. And if the 30 minute one goes over, make it 15. Because what you'll find is the less time you have, you're, you're gonna focus on the important stuff. What's the decision we have to make? Let's get to that quickly. And a lot of the other stuff is gonna be filtered out. And so I think the cramming is a good thing because it means there's some things you couldn't fit in and those things weren't that important anyway. Thank you. Uh, along the lines of bad choices being made in your absence, how do you deal with the tyranny of Slack availability and how difficult it is not to respond to urgent messages? That's like so well worded, that, that question. Um, yeah, I, ha I struggle with this because I, I always want to be available on Slack as a manager. I just, you never know what someone's dealing with, like, and if I could make it a little bit better for them by actually responding timely, then it's, then I feel like I've done my job. Um, I don't know. I don't have like a good solution. Sometimes it, I'll check it. And then if it's not urgent, I won't respond. Like it, it's about sending boundaries and like, I guess it depends who, like if it's someone directly that like is on my team, I try to have like a quick SLA, you know, like, the time in which I'll respond back to them. But if it's like a person all the way on the other side of the org, <laughs> um, my, about my like SLA is a little bit longer. Yeah, Alicia, could you repeat the, the phrase? Was it the burden of Slack? Uh, tyranny. tyranny. <laughs> well said. I feel like Matt yeah. has a question. The tyranny. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I think um, I, you make a good point, Lima, that like your availability is earned. Right, like you're saying, like if you know that person well, especially if it's someone that's on your team, yeah. you might be more responsive. It's if it's someone you don't know that well, then it's going to be a longer SLA, and I, I think that's a good thing. I think you're, you're, I mean, you're basically saying, in other words, like your time is valuable, right. and um, the person has has to earn that. I think it's a judgment call. I guess it's similar uh, for me. I, I think um, you want to, I think you want to have some sense of boundaries. You know, like if 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 someone sends me a Slack message, well, first of all, like. I don't have Slack notifications even on, on my phone. Like if I, if I go into Slack, I'll see that I have a message, but if I don't go in, I don't see it. That's just, I don't know how you can live without your phone configured that way. Um, but I do check it probably, you know, I would say at a minimum, I get on there like every two hours, maybe not on a weekend, just, just to make sure that nothing's blowing up. And, um, you know, I might check it at 9 PM and someone sent me a message and it's a judgment call, whether I'm going to respond or not. If it's someone that I know, and I can do something to unblock them, then yeah, I'm going to, um, I'm going to respond. If it's someone I don't know as well, it's not mm -hmm. as urgent. I can wait till tomorrow morning. I definitely have Slack on my phone, but I don't have it on my watch. So. <laughs> I swear I just heard that Slack noise like 10 <laughs> yeah, seconds ago also. I have to turn my phone the other way so I wouldn't get distracted. What are the odds during that question we'd hear that noise? <laughs> Thank you. Sometimes just thinking about Slack, I phantom hear that noise. <laughs> <laughs> the tyranny of the noise even. Mm -hmm. uh, On-call rotations are difficult when there are differences in experience and skill sets of team members. Mm -hmm. Other than documenting the fix, how do you ensure all calls do not get funneled into the one experienced person? That's hard. Like, uh, yeah, I mean, right now we have, shadowing like there's a lot of shadowing going on with the um newer engineers on my team with the more seniors but it's yeah i think it's just like making a conscious effort and maybe being okay that some issues will take longer but it's worth it to, to resolve but it's worth it if that engineer then learns something but that's 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 something i really struggled with when i first joined spotify was we had so many good senior engineers and they would just solve problems so quickly. And then they would, the other, like, and the newer engineers would learn from it by like via the incident call or, you know, the like post-mortem. 
but um, it's it, it it kind of takes removing that person from the squad. I mean, they're still there for help and like, but they need they need to step away. Is the only way I can think of it. Do you have any thoughts, Matt? Yeah, I mean that that question is worthy of its own talk you know, because <laughs> I think this is a a problem at a lot of companies. Um, I think there's a bunch of solutions. I think the simplest one is, yeah, the, the, the few people that take the most of the, the issues, they need to take more vacations and they need to not answer their Slack messages when they're on vacation because uh -huh. your team has to like build that muscle, you know, I think. Um, so there's a, there's there's a couple issues. The one is just like straight up technical knowledge. Like that person just knows more about systems. They can see this type of error and know that this is when this thing calls that thing and the cache is, you know, um, filled or not filled or whatever. And that's something you can solve by just kind of word of mouth, shadowing, documentation. I think there's also like a confidence issue. It, it depends on, depending on what your production systems look like, sometimes it's, do we flip this switch or not? When do we fail over? When do we turn this dial up or down? Um, I used to work at Netflix and there was certainly like, that was our life. But it's, do you have the confidence to flip that switch knowing that that might be the right choice or that might make it the problem like twice as bad? And that's something that that's like cultural. And I think like you might have, there might be an engineer on your team that like knows all of the, the technical details, but the, the skill of like knowing how to build up other people so that they can be, they can emulate the same things that you are doing. That's a whole different skill set that I think we, um, we need to focus on more too. That it's not that's just the technical knowledge, it's the confidence to try things, um, et cetera. So I know like what we used to do was really important for us is when we have a new person, make sure we're building up their confidence, make sure that we have them do a deployment and I'll be right, I'll be over your shoulder watching you do it. I can step in if you make a mistake. Um, so I think that type of that aspect of it's really important too. Thank you. I'm so glad you didn't say throw them in the deep end. <laughs> Another question. You mentioned if you're doing your best work at night, what can you do if this is actually how you operate, but it doesn't, it directly contrasts with what the rest of your team does? That's a really good one. I have some folks like that on my team. And I'm okay with it as a manager. Like I know that they are less available during the day because they work better at night. Uh, I don't know if that's a norm for most managers. Like, I don't know if that, but like I personally, I know that they're, they can write code they can focus in at night better and i guess just my ex especially with working from home right now i just have no expectations i don't ping them before, until after 12 for example because i know that they're going to be working later in the day um but that's might not be the best answer because I, I don't know if that's like an anomaly like if other teams do that yeah i mean we, we talk about diversity a lot but there's there's like brain diversity, right? There's we different people just operate at better at different times of day, or even the way we think about our time, um, the way that we balance our day. Like I definitely like I need a flexible schedule because sometimes my best work is happening at 8 p.m. and I'm just like brain dead at 1 p.m. And I've certainly had like managers before where that was that was an issue. That's you know some 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 companies and some teams are more like you need to be available and it, um and able to do your best work between these specific hours. And if you're not able to do that, then it just doesn't work out. So I think it's um, ideally you have a, a manager like Lima that is looking for what your strengths and, and weaknesses are and is able to kind of accommodate you. But I, I think if you don't, you just, I, mean, I don't know, if you're doing your best work at night and like that doesn't work for your team, I don't have a suggestion other than find a new team. I mean, sometimes you're just not compatible with the way or your team operates. Maybe like, I don't know, a lot of it is like about trust. Like I just, I, I trust that my, that the engineers that I'm talking about will, so maybe you just build that trust and then, you know, trust credibility, all those keywords, and then it should be fine for the team at some point. Maybe that's what's missing. I don't know. Um, but I know that's key for me. It's like, I, I trust them. Like, I know they're going to do it at that time. So, yeah. Thank you. With the switch to remote, has your estimate of energy drain changed between in-person meetings being on camera or meetings off camera? 
Yeah. I, yeah. I think I can, mm, I know some, for some of my one-on-ones, we, we both decide to go off camera. Like we, we just talk and there's no video on and it, we, it feel <laughs> it's easier. Like it, it's less, not that one-on-ones are draining, but sometimes it could be, it's easier to talk when the video is off. Um, I can, I can compare to in-person. I find, I find video calls a little bit more tiring than in-person because in-person there's like walking <laughs> to the meeting. And then there's like, oh, I'm going to be 10 minutes late because I'm going to stop by this person's desk and it's okay. But like, wh wh where, what, what desk was I at, at home, you know? Um, but that, that, that's not really the question, but I, I know that I, with regards to drained energy, it's more draining to have the video on because I feel like I have to be present and look presentable and all that good stuff, you know? Yeah. I think the team I'm on now, most people keep their cameras off, oh, nice. which is, which is refreshing. Um, I, I mean, if you want to have your camera off, turn it off. I, I mean, I think especially if, if it makes you feel better for any reason. Yeah. I definitely think, I mean, with video meetings, you don't get the benefit of like being able to, I don't know, enjoy the scenery. It depends on what your office is like. Um, it gives you or, or walk, like Lima said. But yeah, I think I'm, I'm not sure if the core of your question is like, do you notice a, a, a difference in energy drain, whether camera is on or off? Yeah, I mean, camera off is a lot more relaxing. Um, and so I think if that, if you feel the same way, just turn it off. Thank you. Uh, despite us being on camera right now. <laughs> That's everything I see for questions in Zoom and Slack. If people have more questions, the conversation can continue in hashtag room B, uh, hashtag being the room symbol. Again, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, we've still got a few more talks in the afternoon. Thank you, Lima and Matt. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Alicia. Right. Goodbye, all. <laughs>